Well, thank you, uh, all three of you, for those uh, introductory remarks. Let's get into a discussion of this. Um, I'm about to open the floor to, to questions, but before I do that, um, Minister, I think I'd just like to give you a chance to respond to what you've heard from the other two, because there's a, a clear observation there that there is a, a trend back towards authoritarianism. Many Iraqis might say, you need a strong man in Iraq. We are a, a divided and perhaps divisive people. Our history shows that. You need somebody with a firm hand at the centre. But could you say a bit more about uh, what is in uh, the Prime Minister's mind, what he wants to create in Iraq, and what the capacity is for coalition politics in Iraq? Because as other countries in the Middle East region begin to change their systems of government, uh, once they've got rid of the previous lot, they're finding it very difficult to agree amongst themselves where they go to next. Is that still the state of affairs in Iraq? And, and how does the Prime Minister want to get out of that trend and bring the people's interests into this? Thank you. Um, um, I almost do agree with the, all the presentation of our friend, um, Mr. Dodge, what had said. And the, uh, being a Prime Minister in a country like Iraq, I think is not an easy job. And uh, I'm quite sure that the, I don't want to polish any face, by the way. And I don't want to defend uh, wrong policies. But I do agree that in a country like Iraq, which inherited that huge difficulties and problems, and those who live in Iraq, they could understand what I mean. Plus an additional regional influence, plus the sectarian element, which is we are facing now and the regional competition and being, being uh, uh, looked as Iraq is uh, like a, 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 an Iranian state. All this, a man who is ruling Iraq or a man of, uh, like a prime minister needs to have a formula and needs to make the political process inclusive of everybody, which is again, with all this taking in consideration that it is not a, a, an easy job. Taking in consideration that he had, he, when he, in 2006, when he been elected as a prime minister, um, western side of Iraq is the hand of Al-Qaeda. On a daytime, the government, they could make a rally in Al-Ambar and even Baghdad, in the places of Baghdad, that the security is not in the hand of the government. In Basra, fully that the people are there without the control of the government. I think British there and they could know much better that the situation. And the man come and he did whatever he, he, he had did in Basra and in Baghdad and Al-Ambar with the help of the alliances and especially Americans. Finally, that the situation comes and don't deny that also there is parties, as Toby had said, that the parties, how they rule the ministries which they been in charge for, it's totally like their farm. And uh, I don't exclude, exclude any of the parties which is participating in the government. So we end up with a situation. I do agree that Iraq needs a strong man, but a strong man subjected to a rule of law. This is the very important issue. The prime minister is thinking that there is a conspiracy from neighboring countries against him and against Iraq. And I could, you, could, you could read, most of you are, are analysts, and you could read that what is the situation in Iraq. Iraq is not, the system in Iraq is not welcomed by, none of the countries are welcoming the way of governance in Iraq. Maybe Kuwait is an exception, but all of the countries, they have a hand, and especially taking now as a Turkish role in the region and the situation which has been escalated between the prime minister, both the prime ministers in Turkey and Iraq, all this added on, on, on Maliki to think that he is, you know, he is, a, the, there is a great conspiracy from the neighboring countries. They want to uh, crush him, they want to destroy him. And again, you could say even today morning he had a meeting and he said this is a conspiracy. 
against me and the people whom they vote and they want to make no confidence vote, it's a conspiracy. He is under that impression that the uh, uh, regional countries uh, uh, led by Turkey wants to make this co no confidence vote against him. This is, again, you should read it in this way, that he is uh, uh, feeling that there is a real conspiracy trying to get him out. Uh, I am quite sure that many of the people, they might not agree with this, but again, <laughs> I mean, with the situation which is, uh, uh, he is running, I think he is in a very difficult situation. He is very hard situation. And with uh, meeting all the demand of the, uh, of the services of the people and under the pressure of the election, he is behaving in a way to maintain at least the unity. Again, one more th issues, which is the Kurdistan. Kurdistan dispute, which adding more and more on him. I definitely not agree that what Salih al-Mutlaq had said or the others, what al is saying, because at the end they are a competitor. Like, I mean, others, they would like to share his power, which is defined in the Constitution, in the security that he is a command in chief. And this is not shared with the, with the other parties. He should take a decision. There is a national council, a security council, which uh, uh, taking the important and main decision of the security there. There, there, there is a committee, like a ministerial committee. The only, he cannot take the opinion of Salih al-Mutlaq or Tariq al-Hashimi or Yadi al-Lawi or the others while he's taking any decision of the security. He th thought that the security is not shared with the others. Other thing, all the decision is being taken in the, in the cabinet and I think the cabinet proved to be uh, out of all this problem and disputes and the, and the differences which is going on right now. And I think the Prime Minister, remarkably, he had managed to uh, chair the, the cabinet in a professional way, not politicize it, not uh, making it any reflection of the political disputes on the cabinet. Thank I'm you. Sorry, taking off that. Right, uh, open to the floor. If I call you, please stand up, state your name, uh, and ask a question quite quickly. Not too many statements, please. I'll move from the left, the front there, please, and I'll come through the hands that have been raised. Okay, uh, Tom Hardy Forsyth, Coventry University, and also uh, senior advisor on uh, capacity building for the Kurdistan Regional Government for quite a number of years. Uh, one of the things that Mr. Maliki said a while ago was that uh, one of the reasons he was unhappy with the Constitution was it, it was that it had been foisted on them rather quickly and needed some, some adjustment. Uh, I was surprised at that because uh, in October, November and December 2000, uh, way back in 2002, all the, all the major parties in opposition met together and had a, and produced a detailed paper, you probably remember this, the transition to democracy in Iraq. And one of the things the papers called for was democratically and federally structured Iraq based on principles of separation of powers and the protection of individual and group human rights, setting out a roadmap for transition uh, to a permanent constitution. Uh, I'm rather worried that, in fact, the excuse of uh, a slightly underdeveloped constitution as being used actually just to coalesce uh, centralised centralized power. And I certainly reject any idea that the, the, the Kurdistan regional government isn't particularly question, playing fairly. Question, please. So can I ask a question? Yes. Why is Mr Maliki uh, centralising power? And frankly, you're making him sound paranoid. Let's take one or two more questions so we see what the tone of the room is. Uh, the fourth row there and then the back left. Uh, my name is Sam Nassif and I'm a member of... Could you Jet stand Arms. up? Yeah. My question is, uh, it seems from what uh, uh, Your Excellency said that what uh, Prime Minister Maliki needs at the moment most is allies and he seems to be creating uh, enemies. 
so uh, do you think that there will be a solution with his uh, confrontation with uh, Tariq al-Hashimi that is uh, more political? And do you think that any of the uh, remaining uh, uh, so-called resistance of the Saddam people is still doing some of the uh, acts, uh, violent acts on the Iraqi scene? Thank you. Thank you. And thirdly, before we stop for reply, at the back there, yes. Thank you, Cho Kong from Shell. My question to Toby. Uh, Toby, you set out two scenarios for Iraq very clearly. Can you tell us uh, where Kurdistan and the Kurds fit into both scenarios and the prospects for oil exports from that region? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you've partly answered the uh, two of the questions that came. Do you want to add anything? Yes, to what um, you just the, said? Regarding Hashimi, uh, Hashimi issue is fully judicial. Nothing to do now. Today, where the court and it's been postponed one more, once more. Um, 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 I do agree that the way which has been presented earlier, the Hashimi issue it was being misreported, mispresented. Uh, but uh, now, totally everybody understands that the Hashimi issue, there is 150 files against Hashimi from the others, from the victims. Regarding the resistance of Saddam people, yes, we are facing some of still. There are people which would, uh, were not happy because they lost power, but it's much less than before. Just adding on why Maliki is centralizing the power. In the absence of the institution, this is what we are facing in Iraq. Iraq, as uh, Emma said, uh, uh, democracy is not election. Till now, it is very fragile institution in Iraq. And this is a big risk, whether Maliki is there or other person, our uh, prime minister. Absence of the institution is a huge risk for our country uh, and for the democracy. Thank you. Toby? Yes, I, um, I suppose there are three big points. Uh, I think the Iraqi constitution is unworkable. It's a dreadful document, um, drafted in a, in a hurry and in a completely uh, closed way. The fact that the Prime Minister wants to rework it is no surprise. I don't think it's a workable document. Um, to, to directly address uh, Cho's point, what, the, what do the Kurds want? Well, the Kurds drafted that dreadful document. They're the, they're, they're, they're the, the, the Barzani and Talibani were the key authors of it with their advisors. Um, and they, are, they were striving from probably the peak of the power in 2003 through to continually limit the power of Baghdad, to, to, to federalize, if not fracture, the state. Um, that said, they do very nicely out of Baghdad. They, I think they get $14 billion a year without uh, having to do much for it. They don't pay tax to Baghdad. They're, they don't uh, give control over their military forces to Baghdad. So I'm kind of, you want to go to Baghdad and you find a certain frustration about the uh, Kurdish regional government. Uh, you, you want your cake and eating it too, or you want to be half pregnant or whatever the, the metaphor would be. We want to complain. We want to keep Baghdad as weak as possible, but we've not really got round to plucking up the courage to move towards independence because we get $14 billion a year from the central government. Um, I think that situation will stumble on. I can, I can very much see uh, Masoud Bazan's worries about the, uh, is it F-15s or the, the, the planes being bought from the United States. But I think, the, and, I, and I think ironically, Taliban has proved this, the only way to shape an Iraq you want is to be down there in Baghdad fighting and neg what, negotiating, being forceful with unvarnished tongues uh, about what they want. I think this, this constant threat, which is at the moment completely unrealistic and I don't think should be taken very seriously, to secede is, 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 is the th it's theatre, it's pantomime. It's not, I, I don't think it's serious politics. On centralising power and Hashimi, I don't know if uh, Hashimi is guilty or not, and I suspect no one else does because... Uh, under torture, his, guard, his security guards, when they're in, the, uh, when they're in uh, locked up by the Iraqi state, died. I think that indicates the. Uh, I very much uh, agree with his, his Excellency that we should aspire to the rule of law, but the rule of law doesn't exist in Iraq, especially in Iraq, where uh, people charged die under torture in prisons, and no one and no one is punished for it. So I, I, I think the guilt or innocence of Hashemi may or may not come out. He's fled the country. I suspect he won't come back. But what has come out from that incident? is firstly 
that his bodyguards were tortured to death in order to extract their confessions. And secondly, when the tanks were surrounding his house, they were also surrounding the Deputy Prime Minister's house and the Ministry of Finance's house. That leaves me very worried that it's not actually Hashemi's crimes or not. We don't know his, uh, yet. But it was a larger power play that may well come to destabilize Iraqi politics. But sorry, is it, is it necessary that you should know Hashemi is guilty or not? It's not our job that you or should I should know. There is a court there. There is an investigation. There is 150 50 victims, and there is files against him. Now, I can't defend that how those people, whether they tortured that guy, al battawi which he dead and due to the, uh, as the report said. I don't want to defend that issue. But this will not clear the responsibility of Hashimi being guilty and he is involved. And I think anybody knows the guy. I don't want to uh, give any sort of uh, 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 final verdict on, on Hashimi, but I said it's not our job. Court is doing this, and Justice Authority is doing that, and to say whether Mal uh, Hashimi is guilty or not. And it is not necessary that everybody should know he's guilty or not. His lawyer is there, and he is, uh, he is enjoying the full right to defend and to put a lawyer. One does wonder what type of defense he'll get when key witnesses were tortured to death when they were, uh, when they were under arrest. Well, that, that didn't clear the, 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 the problem and difficulties that Hashimi and, and the victims and the, all the crimes which he did, even though if this guy is did, this we couldn't con condemn it, and it's wrong, but this will not clear the responsibility of Hashimi. Okay, let's cover other issues. Emma, you haven't commented yet on this. We are where we are, perhaps, in the state of, uh, of the evolution of Iraqi politics. What, what do you think the Iraqi people are looking for in this? I think more than anything, the Iraqi people fear a return to violence again. They saw the abyss. They don't want to go back to that. And I think when they look at these squabbling going on among the politicians, a lot of them think they're all bad. They think everybody's corrupt, everybody's taking money. And I think they just yearn for stability and normality, a return to normalcy again. Well, what you're painting is the potential picture for Iraq to return to the queue of the Arab Spring uh, under, under that sort of uh, scenario. So uh, this may go around more than once. Let's come to this side of the, the hall. We'll go, we'll take some questions going back. We haven't got very much time left. Second row here, please. Uh, Morris Samuels, a member of Chatham House. There's um, a microphone. Uh, Morris Samuelson, member of Chatham House. Do, you, do any of you envisage the repoliticization of the armed forces? Politicization of the armed forces. Two rows back, the white jacket. Thank you, Philip Wilkinson from Chatham House. I'm told by my contacts in Baghdad that the National Security Council is about to embark on a national security review in order to rationalize the missions, roles, and architecture of the various security forces. I wonder if um, any of the panel have heard such a thing and can confirm or deny the likelihood of a new national security review to develop a new national security strategy and rationalize the security forces. We'll take one more, the left there, yes. My name is Frank Dominey. I'm a telecommunications engineer. I do skills transfer and uh, economic development. Um, when I was in Iraq uh, last year, the place was summarized to me as being 10% uh, illiteracy, 1% internet penetration, and eight hours a day electricity. So I think Dr. Dodge uh, agrees with me. Uh, there's also a drought in the country and an uh, impending uh, riparian dispute uh, among Syria, uh, Turkey and Iraq along the Euphrates and the uh, Tigris. Um, listening to the description of the squabbling of the politicians, I'm wondering to myself, what is preventing the establishment of a layer of technocrats uh, who would actually address these problems, which need to be addressed no matter who is running whatever ministry. Thank you. That's my question. Minister, do you want to um, go there? 
the politicizing the military for I don't think that um, I don't I don't do want to defend uh, some of the wrong and negative things but I don't think that we have a politicizing the military forces military forces is um, built in a good way compared with the Ministry of Interior I think this is a, a remarkable everybody knows but I do agree that we are trying our best to protect the military from any penetration of the parties, which is, again, is a competition. Uh, uh, I could also um, could say that Maliki is trying his best not to allow party, even his party, to allow. But uh, I, again, I don't say that it is an ideal situation for that. The, the technocrats, we are facing a problem with the parties. Parties are doing uh, destruction in the country in, in, in bringing uh, non-efficient uh, and efficient people got no skill management, no technical skill, and they keep them not only on a ministerial level, even you go down below in DGs and everyone, uh, dumping people, um, uh, not efficient, efficient people in the ministry that you could find. Now we have a problem. Since 10 years, we couldn't solve most of the difficulties, which could be solved. It's not connected with the security situation. I can't, I can't blame, uh, I can't find any justification for why not getting a good uh, uh, rice or good sugar for the people, for poor people. This is not connected with the, with the security or uh, Al-Qaeda is stopping the, you know, the government from providing good ration card for food for the people. So this is a problem. We have a technocrats and a good level of technocrats in Iraq, and we have a party which never give a, a, a chance for those people independent unless he become a party member. He got no chance to get any post in the government. And this is one of the negative things which is going to influence the, uh, the progress and development of the country. Either of you want to comment on that, Toby? Yeah, I, I suppose a couple of things. I think the great heroes of Iraq are indeed the Director Generals, His Excellency mentioned. These are kind of senior permanent civil servants, a lot of them educated uh, in the 60s and 70s, a lot of them educated in, in Britain, who have went back and who, who hold, held the Iraqi state together on a wing and a prayer. Now think about what these senior aged civil servants went through. Iran-Iraq War, 80 to 88. Then the invasion of Iraq over a decade of harsh sanctions. When that finishes in 2003, they're catapulted into a civil war. In the midst of a civil war, they were deliberately targeted by al-Qaeda, amongst others. These people have been through hell, and the result is an incredibly weak Iraqi state. What do the Iraqi population want? Yes, of course they want order. They've, they've got more order than they've had recently. They want electricity. Eight hours is, is very optimistic. I, I think across, eight hours would be the, the peak of the average. Clean running water and things. And the Iraqi state, targeted under sanctions, under civil war, under war, is incredibly weak. Now, there is a problem with the politics that leaks di directly back to the civil servants. As a minister comes in, as this national system of, of national governments come in, she or he purges or simply adds on to the payroll of any ministry a series of hires that are directly to do with party political loyalty. The state's payrolls have massively expanded, not with technocrats, with party functionaries because the state has become a way of funding party loyalty. That's directly undermined and hindered the state's ability. So we have a huge state. Now one thing that was built under the occupation for obvious reasons very quickly are the security services. The, uh, the Iraqi army was continually expanded under American orders. The, Iraqi, uh, the, the Americans built the Iraqi Special Operation Forces. 4,200, uh, 4, I think, generally considered to be the best special forces in the region. What happened when the Americans handed it back to the Iraqis? The Prime Minister set up a separate ministry to run the special forces. They're now called, in popular parlance, the Jaysh al-Maliki, in a historical, ironical reference to the impression that they use as the Prime Minister's dirty squad to do stuff that he needs to be done, sadly, beyond the rule of law. So the, 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 the Iraqi armed forces have been highly uh, politicised, but that said, and everyone's always asking for light at the end of the tunnel, they can impose a rough and ready order across the country. So Iraq isn't heading back to civil war. Quite where it is heading, we don't know. Emma? 
On the issue of the services, I think many Iraqis look at all that money. <clears throat> Iraq is an incredibly wealthy country. Why are public services not improved? Why do people have such few hours of electricity a day? I think most Iraqis believe it's due to corruption, that every time the contracts go out to improve something, those contracts are never delivered. Okay. They're skimming off the contracts. Likewise with the security problems. A lot of people believe that security officials are bribed to allow people through checkpoints with, um, well, with bombs. In terms of the armed forces, you know, these armed forces have been built up very quickly to large numbers in a very short period of time. There's almost one million people who are in the security forces. There are some very good security forces, and there are security forces which are not so good. The question, of course, is how they are used. And you can think of certain circumstances where there will be no problems. But if tensions escalate in the north between KRG and central government, if that deteriorates, if security forces are used, then there really will be a problem within those security forces and who are members loyal to. Thank you. Um, Chatham House is um, instituting a new feature in these uh, discussion groups uh, where it remains online and people send in their questions online. So I'm going to end with an online question uh, for the Minister of State, which is about Syria, uh, Dr. Ali. Um, Iraq's uh, view, the, the official government, the Prime Minister's view of what was happening in Syria seemed to evolve as, as things moved. Um, what, what are the main features of the Iraqi view of what's happening in Syria and where do you think this is going to go? As I explained, we never support the present regime of Bashar al-Assad. We suffer from Syrian government much more than the Lebanese suffered from Syrians. Uh, everybody knows. We said more than 50. Prime Minister said 80% of the terrorism coming from Syria. This is the fact, and we had raised the issue with the United Nations against the Syrian government. So we'll never support the, the way which Syrian been ruled. But it's not our job. This is a Syrian people. But we know very well that the thing which is going on, the, uh, the, the, all the arrangement and the support and the against or whatever is going, we are not part of it. We are officially supporting the Arab initiative uh, 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 by the Arab League and the, as I said with the Kufi Annan, we do understand that you could ignite and the fire, the forest fire by a small match and what is going on in Syria is this. But nobody could control the fire will be extended. We are the country will be suffer, not Qatar will suffer. We Iraq suffer. We could understand and justify how Saudi Arabia and the Gulf state they control the issue and they say, so they solve the problem in Yemen. We could understand that because Yemen is, is directly influencing the security of Saudi Arabia. So we have the same right that to, to, look, to look after our security and at the same time for the freedom of our brothers in Syria, not in this way, which is igniting a fire and a sectarian fire in Syria. We're warning everybody that the thing which is going on in Syria and the way which is being managed is not going to lead to any way of the unity of Syrian people and Syria as a country and getting the full freedom of the Syrian people. In contrary, it will ignite a big fire in the region. And we are warning everybody and we are trying peacefully and with the all what limited role which we have in Syrian issue, we are trying to do something. Hopefully that people could understand at the end that this is not the right way because massive killing is going on and day after day, we could see horrific uh, uh, killing and attack in the Syrian. We don't know its sources from where, but of course, the present regime is fully responsible for all the blood which has been there in Syria. Egypt's going through uh, an agony. Libya's going through an agony. Syria's going through an agony. Uh, Yemen is going through an agony. Um, Iraq hasn't completed its agony just because its transition started 
nine years ago. Uh, and we've heard in this hour uh, the, about the features of uh, what is constituting the present period in Iraq. There remains something of a vacuum in terms of a collective spirit, in terms of true security, in terms of coalition government, and in terms actually of realizing the uh, rights of the people and what they were expecting when Saddam was removed. Uh, and there is, to some extent, a vacuum in terms of the implementation of the Constitution that you've heard described as inadequate in certain ways, but into which a lot of work has gone in a country where actually the history of preparing constitutions goes back a long way. Uh, the Iraqis know what they want to write down in their constitution and what they want. Um, there's a long way to go. It takes time for these transitions to produce an ordered society with the people uh, judging what they want under the rule of the institutions. And until the institutions are more powerful than the individuals, there is going to continue to be trouble. We have to recognize that. But, uh, Minister, I think we can say from this House that there remains in this country a tremendous sympathy uh, for the transition which Iraq is going through, uh, but it remains a sympathy for the people of Iraq and not necessarily for any particular leader in Iraq. It's the people who come first. And if the leaders of Iraq don't understand what's happening in other parts of the Arab world, that the voice of the people is now of greater political force than it used to be, they will be making a very big mistake. But thank you, all three of you, for what you've contributed to this session. Thank you in the audience for, for listening patiently uh, and for producing your own comments on what's going on. And a particular thank you to His Excellency for taking his time off to join us. Thank you all very much. Thank you.